Uh, my power went out last night in the storm and still wasn't on this morning, so I haven't had hot water in a day uh, or any way to charge my laptop or anything, so we'll see how this goes. Don't procrastinate, kids. Uh, my name is... <laughs> My name is Graham Brown. Uh, I live here in Indianapolis. I own a clothing company called United State of Indiana that makes apparel and gifts that feature designs that celebrate Indiana. If that's your thing, look us up, please. Uh, I also own a custom screen printing company called United State Print Co. If you need shirts printed, please, please, please hit me up. The people in this room are fun to do small projects like a t-shirt with, and you guys also know what vector files are, which makes my life easier for sure. So I'm happy to work with you anytime. Uh, but I wanna talk about something different today. I wanna talk about three things that we can all do to be better designers. First, get more sleep. Second, eat better. And third, play more video games. I'm actually fucking with you because I know nothing about the first two points and we will be talking only about video games. Uh, how many people in the room play video games a lot? How many play games sometimes? And how many don't play video games really ever at all? Uh, so for the past couple of years, I've spent a lot of my spare time playing video games, but also studying game design, development, and the video game industry. And I think that it's a really underrated source of inspiration for designers outside the game space. You might lump it in with other forms of couch entertainment, so movies, TV, even books, and you should do that, but games are different. Those other mediums implore their audience to think and feel things. Games make the addition of asking the audience to do things and to solve problems. Games also adapt way faster than any other entertainment. Any other entertainment. So games were on the internet way before TV and movies. They were on our computers. They were on our phones. All the defining devices of how we design in 2019, games were there first. You are the people designing the world around us. And video games have already blazed some trails that I think at work you're at the precipice of um, as we learn what it means to deal with faster and faster technology cycles. As things become more and more interactive, and as basically everything has a screen put on it, video games, whatever that means, video games have been doing that since they were born. Like that is the video game equation. So there's going to be a lot to learn. I think within five years, every job title in this room will be drawing heavy inspiration from the work of game designers. I don't want you to be scrambling to catch up. So I think you should start playing games now and see how it shapes you in the work you do. I don't know what the result is gonna be. I'm not gonna tell you how to do your job. This isn't like bullet points of how to bring game design into your work. Cause I have no idea what any of you do, but I am confident that having a familiarity and a vocabulary, vocabulary of game design will help you in some way craft a unique um, identity for yourself as a designer in whatever field you're in. Um, so a few caveats before we get started. First, I believe what I'm saying is important. I grew up playing video games and I also grew up watching pro wrestling. I could give a talk about the design lessons to learn from pro wrestling. And I think that would be interesting. I don't think it would be important. So if you're the, if you're the kind of person who says like, yeah, Graham, I've played video games. They're just not my thing. I'm gonna push back on that uh, because I can confidently say when you find the right games, they will change you. Just like I can confidently say when you find the right music or find the right book, it will change you. Uh, the second caveat, if you've been burned by games, if you've played something or watched something or watched someone play something that made you say, this is really gross, this is hateful, this is way too violent, I'm sorry that that happened, it probably was all of those things. Games found a foothold in the market by playing to some base desires of young men in the 90s. So this was the Marilyn Manson and the Eminem era. So things got gross and obscene and violent and misogynistic. Luckily, enough time has passed since then that you can interact with thousands of games and never have to go back to the gross stuff. Third, if you know anything about gamification, gamification is taking literal elements of games and putting them in other products. So that's like speedy rewards points. If you know anything about gamification, put it out of your mind for 20 minutes. Uh, I don't find that particularly interesting and it's not what I want to talk to you about. Unless your title 
at your company is game designer, like my stance is that you're probably underqualified to be making games or to be doing literal games. The influence of games on you as a designer will be more interesting than that. Um, so oh, the title of my talk is Ludology and Design. Ludology comes from the Latin word ludus, which means to play. Ludology is the study of games and the people who play them. So let's start with the thing that everyone notices first about a game, the graphics. Um, graphic designers, listen up. Some of your most talented peers work in the game industry, and you should know what they're doing. It's easy to lump game graphics into one of two styles. The first is this. Uh, it's called pixel art. Uh, it's designed at a very small resolution and then scaled up to the screen so that each pixel is visible and vital to, to the design. In the early days of video games, this was a necessity. Computers couldn't handle much visual information, so artists had to be really creative with how they used the few pixels that they had. Uh, for example, the original Mario character was only 12 pixels by 16 pixels. So that is a, it's crazy to think about like a global pop culture icon that came out of such a tiny piece of digital art. The original Mario Brothers game, the entire game, all the art, the sound, and the code that made the game work, the entire file size was 31 kilobytes, which is crazy because this screenshot was 78 kilobytes. So I'm, I'm requiring more than twice as much digital information just to show you a picture as those designers needed to create an entire world that a lot of us grew up in. So there's a lot to learn about designing efficiently within technical constraints in video games. The second style that might come to mind is this, uh, hyper-realism. These are games that are always pushing technical boundaries to look more and more like the real world. I don't find pixel art or this hyper-realism particularly interesting for design work outside of games. Um, they've been done to death and they look like video games and that's kind of what I want to get away from. So I wanted to show you a few of my favorite games that have come out in the past uh, couple years that look great but don't look like video games to hopefully pique your interest. Uh, the first is this game. It's called Cuphead. This is a game that emulates animation styles from the 1920s and 30s and does a really good job. So all of this artwork and the lettering is all hand-drawn and then brought into a computer system. Uh, it's 50,000 slides of animation and it was over two years of work just to animate the characters alone. So a couple of years ago, the, tech, the technology to run a system like this to be programming hand-drawn animations didn't exist, but we're there now and it looks awesome. Uh, the second game is a game called Grease. Uh, this is just an example of a really phenomenal, beautiful looking game. You can see it's just, it's a character style that you do not expect in a video game at all. And there's this scene where you're being chased by a sea monster that just looks like a, a Disney movie, right? I mean, it's just wild that this scene is accepting user input. Think about being the person to design this scene and knowing that no two users would ever see it in the exact same way. You're not designing that moment when the jaws snap down, you're just designing the space so that the user can make it happen. Um, so that's super interesting. Next is a game called Ape Out, where you play an ape escaping a research facility. This is a violent game, but I think we can all agree violence when it's animals hurting humans is totally fine. Uh, so it's hard to look at this game and not think of the work of graphic designer Saul Bass. If you're familiar with Saul Bass, like this game looks like a Saul Bass movie poster. So games have been around long enough that they're not referencing themselves anymore. They're looking to the genius outside of their space and bringing that into their work. And I think that's, kind of, that's like the intersection that I want the graphic designers in the room to live in. Like games don't need to look like games. Don't look like Mario. It's been done and you won't do it that well. But think about what else they can look like. Uh, next is a game called Return of the Obra Dinn. This game takes place in 1807. And I think it does a really good job of feeling old in two ways. First, the setting and the character design and the monochromatic presentation makes you think of an old like 1800s photograph. But also, it's at the exact same time, it feels old in a different way because it feels like you're looking at an old computer monitor, right? It's got this green scale and this dot matrix shading. So I think that's a really interesting like double barreled approach to making the user feel like they're interacting with something antiquated. So those are just a few examples, four out of 4,000 and new games come out every day. So I encourage you, if you're a graphic designer and you're the kind of person who's flipping through an Instagram feed or a Pinterest board for just that base level visual inspiration, like get to know games some. 
Uh, an interesting side note. Return of the Obra Dinn, and then the game that I used as an example of hyper-realism, which is called Red Dead Redemption 2, both came out last year. And a bunch of people in the game industry thought that Obra Dinn was the best game of the year. A bunch of people thought that Red Dead was the best game of the year. In the final credits of Red Dead Redemption, over 3,000 names are listed for working on the project. So this game is the collaborative work of over 3,000 people. Return of the Obra Dinn was made by a single person, not a scrappy team of five or ten. One person did all of the sound, the graphics, the writing, and the programming. So what, like, what other medium can you compare neck and neck the work of 3,000 people collaboratively with the singular work of one designer and be able to like, put them on equal podiums as contributions to the greater art form, right? A movie made by one person can only be certain things. Doesn't mean it can't be good, but it is within a bit of a box. And a song made by 3,000 people sucks, right? So, like, imagine the energy being brought here when every team of any size knows that they might be making the next classic. Like, whatever size video game company you're working for, you might have the next huge thing on your hands. And that's a lot of energy to bring. All right, that's graphics. Boom, UI people, I'm just gonna skip my spiel. You guys need, UI people have to be playing video games. Uh, gamers literally live and die by the UI. We need so much information about the status of things communicated to us at once. Uh, it's just a master course in UI. One example, it's hard to think of examples because a lot of times UI should be kind of invisible. You know, it ju you just need to be absorbing the information. Um, so this is a game called uh, Call of Duty Black Ops 4 that I play a lot. So I just took a screenshot. And you can see from a non-gamer, it's kind of hard to tell what's, what even is going on. Um, the, uh, there's a gun, obviously. Does that mean I have five minutes left, that sign? <sighs> all right, you guys are going to get abridged here. Uh, so all around the edge of the screen, I can tell exactly what's going on. Um, at this moment in the game. There's so much information from my health to where I am on the map, to how many people I've killed, how many people are left alive, how many bullets I have, do I have a backpack, what power-ups do I have, how much health do I have, do I have armor? I can absorb all of that as someone familiar with this UI almost instantly and then get my mind back to what the game wants me to think about, which is where is that dead guy's partner because he's probably in this house somewhere and I need to find him. All right, so that's UI, UX, and interaction. Luckily for you, video games exist for no other purpose other than user experience. Every game you encounter will be a case study. Uh, um, skip it. Uh, remove. So those are obvious parallels. And if you have specific jobs that you're wondering how video games could intersect with them, please. Um, talk to me and I can try to draw some more parallels for you. I want to talk about concepts that aren't as obvious. Uh, the first one being difficulty. For a lot of designers, difficulty is a challenge to get over, right? A barrier that you want to overcome for the user. You want things to be effortless and painless. For game designers, difficulty is an integral part of the overall equation and they have to build this well-designed stair step of challenge to keep the user engaged. If the if every level of Mario was as hard as the first one, you would either bounce off at the beginning or you would get bored and leave. Um, so there, uh, there's when you dig into game designs, you will find the you will find the Aaron Draplins, you will find uh, the Michael Bay roots, you will find the people who you say like, oh, I just really like how that guy's or girl's brain works. Um, and a person that does that for me is a designer named Bennett Foddy. Bennett Foddy made a game where you play as a man sitting in a cauldron holding a pickaxe. And the only thing you can do in the game is use the pickaxe as leverage to try to hoist yourself up a mountain. Bennett, and it's impossible. Bennett Foddy is notorious for taking that idea of difficulty and really like fucking it up and making it very hard. So he made a game trailer uh, that for this game, getting over it that I think describes his philosophy well, and it's really interesting. So I will play some of it because we're low on time. Let's see. OK, there's not going to be sound, so I will have to narrate it uh, for Bennett Foddy, which is really an injustice, but, I will, but I'll take this bullet. Why did I make this? 
this horrible hike up an impossible mountain, I could have made something you would have liked, a game that was empowering, that would save your progress, and inch you steadily forward. Since success is delicious, that would have been wise. Instead, I must confess, this isn't nice. It tastes of bitterness, it's capricious, it sets setbacks for the ambitious. It lacks lenience, it's bracing and inhumane. But not everyone is the same. I created this game for a certain kind of person to hurt them. <laughs> and it's really, like, I, I would love for all of us as designers to take on one project where we said, I want to make this project incredibly frustrating to interact with and see what we learned in the process. Because uh, I think that's really interesting. Um, boom. Mario Kart has a really good example that I'm going to cover really quickly of how it uses a design decision based around difficulty. If you know Mario Kart, uh, it's a racing game where you pick up items uh, along the way that either make you go faster or make your opponents go slower. The farther you fall behind in the race, the more powerful and helpful the items become. The farther ahead you get, the less powerful and helpful they become. This is a concept called rubber banding. Uh, because just like a rubber band, the farther apart the group pulls, the stronger the force is, bringing them back into the most fun and exciting equilibrium. Uh, so I had an awesome example that you all won't get to see. I developed an app called Gramly that was a team collaboration app that used the, uh, this concept of rubber banding to keep a team together. So if someone assigned me a task that I didn't know how to do, I was instantly seen a tutorial. If someone assigned me a task and they didn't have any tasks, we pushed that task back on them to keep them from getting too far ahead. Um, customization. Games are really good. Early video games, uh, the key set pieces of early video games weren't really customizable. So everyone played as Mario, right? Red Hat, Big Nose. Um, but as games started going online and stopped being a private experience, and being a communal one, game designers realized that they needed to let players customize the characters that they were controlling uh, in order to achieve two things, to let those players feel recognized and unique. Um, does anyone know what, oh, here's a good example of character creators, skip it. Um, does anyone know what Fortnite is? Has anyone heard of Fortnite? I don't have time to explain Fortnite. I honestly, based on the science, don't have time to do anything else, but we're gonna keep rolling until someone like comes out here and stops me. <laughs> so, so all I need to say about Fortnite is that it, it's an extremely popular, always online game. Uh, and I, I honestly don't think there's ever been a video game with as much immediate cultural impact as this game. Uh, but I don't wanna talk about the game design, even though it is really well designed. I wanna talk about how they make money. Last year, Fortnite brought in $2.4 billion from its users, which comes out to roughly $6.5 million a day just from people playing this game. So you say, how do they do it? Because Here, here's the thing, Fortnite's free. You can download it on your laptop, your phone, whatever right now for completely free. There will never be a point where it asks you for money to unlock a new level or to keep playing the game. It's always free. But they sell costumes. They sell small digital customizations to the character you play uh, so like you can get a red suit, you can get a helmet, you can get a robot suit. They're all very, these, they're the tchotchkes, they're digital tchotchkes. Um, but these things help you, help the user feel recognized and engaged while they're playing. And you can be like, okay, so it's a game sustained by idiots. Like who would spend, who would spend a bunch of money on these little, uh, digital trinkets? Well, I don't want to think about the people who spend a bunch of money, but it's not unreasonable to think of the kid who is playing online for the first time with someone they have a crush on. So she buys a new bomber jacket in the game, so she has something to talk about because she's been worried about that. And it's not hard to think about the person coming home from a long day of work uh, who, just like you, even though you already pay for Netflix and Hulu, will still pay $5.99 to rent a movie because it just hits the spot that night. So that's, that's no different than buying a 399 hang glider just because it hits the spot and you need a little break. Um, so I think this is legitimate. They found a way to monetize this game that added to their design. And what's the alternative? We, well, Senator, we sell ads. That's the alternative, right? <laughs> If Mark Zuckerberg was a game designer, he would have looked at a growing Facebook 
and he would have taken that Fortnite model. He would have said, let's build a system that's so valuable to the users, so fun to interact with, and so compelling that people will be willing to pay for it because they will feel represented and unique in this system. He didn't trust its design that much. He knew the design was bland. He knew the system was sterile. So he made everything free and he made it kind of useful. And then he sold the users. So I'm leading a small charge, telling people to play video games whenever I can, because I want everyone and designers especially to lead a big charge. In the age of ever-changing technology, in an age of interactivity, and in an age of screens being everywhere, bland design should be dead. Sterile systems should be dead, okay? The products we use should be visually interesting, smart in the way they convey information, challenging in a good way, and customized to make us feel represented and unique. At the very least, they should be fun. Those products already exist. They're called video games. We are the designers. We have a duty to go home and interact with those fun, joyful, meaningful products as much as possible and then go to work the next day and see what happens. That's my talk. Thank you.